All right, welcome to this overview of Friedrich Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra. This is going to be a, a four-part video series, really in-depth video series on um, perhaps Friedrich Nietzsche's greatest work. Um, I think arguably his most well-known work, um, The Spoke Zarathustra, um, subtitle A Book for None and All. Um, this is uh, a book which is uh, extremely close to my heart. Um, it's a book which is a very deep part of my um, philosophical history, uh, my philosophical drive, um, and what I hope to build uh, as a sort of my own philosophical career moving into the future. And uh, this video series, again, is a four-part series. It, it, it mirrors the four-part structure of Thus Spoke Zarathustra itself. Um, the book is divided up into four sections. Um, and I'm going to do my best to go into great detail about the core concepts that, that Nietzsche is exploring in this book. Um, it is told through the lens or told through the perspective of a quasi-fictional character, uh, Zarathustra. Um, and it has a style and a tone and a, um, an aim, which I think is completely novel in the history of philosophy. And um, even throughout 20th century philosophy, there, there's not really, I mean, this book stands as a singular, um, really as a singular masterpiece um, that has a very poetic expression. Um, again, it has a sort of, uh, uses fiction and narrative as a vehicle to explore extraordinarily deep philosophy. Um, and, uh, that is one of the reasons why it stands out in the history of philosophy. Um, it, it, it breaks many conventions, it breaks many molds. Um, and in that sense, it's very meta in the sense that uh, what Zarathustra as a character himself is trying to do is to uh, develop a philosophy which is um, certainly beyond what he sees as the Christian world. Um, and what he sees as European civilization up to the present moment. Um, and so he wants to create a whole new sensibility. He wants to create a whole new uh, man, basically, um, from um, many different core principles, which uh, some may strike in the face of the, hit the whole history of religion, some may strike in the face of the entire history of philosophy um, and certainly strike at the core of what many people would consider um, common sense notions of what it means to be alive and what it means to be a human being and the purpose of life and the meaning of life. Um, and I think it still uh, challenges us today, very much so. I still think it speaks to us today. I think the core problems and the core themes that Nietzsche is trying to approach are still very much alive. They're still very much with us. Um, and we are going to actually um, see that right away as we get into the core contents of the book. So let's um, do that. Um, but before I get into that book, uh, you know, I, I want to also let you know that this is, and this the whole part of this four-part series um, is in some sense a preparation. In some sense, it is uh, my attempt to simplify um, the contents of this book, which are going to be explored in much greater depth in a live course, which starts July 14th, 2022. Uh, there's a link in the description if you go to philosophy or you can go to philosophyportal.online and you will see uh, all the information you need about, about the course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This will be the um, second course I'm doing this year. The first course I did was on the Phenomenology of Spirit and there'll be some more information about the results of that course, um, which will be broadcast on this channel shortly. Um, but this will be the second course I'm doing this year and... 
um, if you're interested in diving deeply, uh, either in a live course setting or one-on-one, -on -one, just go check the link in the description and, and, and check out what's on offer. There will also be an opportunity to work towards um, a collective creative project, um, which I've already sort of pioneered and already sort of experimented with a little bit in the Hegel course. So uh, a lot to look forward to. And I think a lot of um, interesting things can come out of approaching this book in full depth and approaching this book in a communal, uh, a, a creatively communal uh, fashion. So uh, check that out if you're, if you're interested. Again, link in the description. So again, this is part of a, a four part uh, video series. This is act, what I'm gonna call act one. Uh, the others will be act two, three, and four. Uh, and I'm calling this act the introduction or introducing the overman. Um, I think what what really holds together the first act is is Nietzsche really forwarding his central principles, forwarding his central ideas, um, and 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 then the rest of the book builds from there. Um, and and we get into some sort of really extraordinarily famous moments in the history of philosophy right off the bat. I mean, Nietzsche comes out of the gate swinging. Um, he's extraordinarily passionate. He's extraordinarily um, fiery. Um, and then again, that's very meta because that's also the principles and that's also the the emotions that he wants to convey with the with the character and the drive of the overman. Um, so uh, again, Act One, introducing the overman. That concept really holds together uh, this act, and and of course, you can say that it holds together the entire book. Um, but in Acts 2, 3, and 4, there will be some subtle distinctions, which we'll um, try to highlight as we, as we move forward beyond that notion. So there's, this, is, this is going to be a, a lot coming at you. I'm going to, um, I'm going to summarize all of this at, a, at the end of the presentation. Um, but these are the core concepts that I want to go into. And these are the core concepts that Nietzsche wants us to reflect on uh, as we move through Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So there's a lot of concepts, 29. I mean, the thing with this book is that it, every line is so rich, every line is so dense uh, that it can be overwhelming. And so, so this presentation is going to use visuals and, and, and trying to simplify very dense concepts. Um, and again, the course itself, the live course itself will be a sort of a, a container and a vehicle um, which can really go to the very heart um, of this entire work and go to the very heart of this um, th this man's message to us, which which I still think uh, resonates with us today. So let's let's start with number one, empty and full heart. So, you know, the book, Thus, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, starts off with um, a, a very interesting um, sort of, let's say, opening, which is the introduction to the character of Zarathustra as having been in a deep solitude for 10 years. Um, you get the impression that this solitude is um, something that has been cultivated in between roughly the ages of, say, 30 and 40. Um, and this solitude, which is which is often uh, linked to a feeling of emptiness or a feeling of clearing, um, specifically in relationship to the human world, human social relationships, um, is presented as the um, method by which uh, one fills one heart. So um, there, there's, there's already a very simple formula at the very start of the Spoke Zarathustra, that between an empty heart and a full heart, uh, that between being in the human world and being alone. Um, and, and, and that mechanism or that method of the relationship between Zarathustra as a character and the human world and solitude and an empty heart and a full heart, that will be something which he continues to develop throughout the acts as a type of meta principle for the book as a whole. Um, but when we encounter uh, his character from the beginning, he is in a state of being full. He is in a state of overflowing. Uh, he is in a state of 
um, almost like a, 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 a readiness to return to the human world because he is to his, 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 his fullness, his overflowingness is uh, too much for himself. He, 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 he feels like he can give selflessly. He feels like he can return to the human world because he, he has nothing to lose by returning to the human world. He is, he is again, over, overflowing with his heart. Um, and, and that um, will nicely transition into the second principle of the book, which is maybe one of the most um, famous principles, maybe combined with the Overman, um, and one of the principles which really still strikes to the heart of our uh, contemporary society, and I think the overall meaning of, 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 of his message to us, which is this idea that God is dead. So I think when we contextualize the idea of God is dead with the first message being basically this relationship between a full and an empty heart, um, we get a sort of deeper insight into what he's trying to tell us with this idea that God is dead. The context for the statement is actually his encountering a saint um, as he's walking down from his uh, solitude on the mountain. Uh, he encounters a, a saint in the woods who tells him, do not go to humans. Humans are imperfect. Um, instead, love God and love animals because God and animals are 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 perfect. And then you can just enjoy your own solitude. You can enjoy your own self-relation. Um, but Nietzsche kind of um, doesn't tell the saint directly that he disagrees with his proposition, that he should love animals and God instead of humans, but uh, introduces this distinction that um, humans are imperfect um, or rather the saint says humans are imperfect. That's why, that's why you sh we shouldn't love them. And, and Nietzsche kind of laughs at this. And I think kind of presents us with the idea that what he is trying to cultivate, uh, what he has tried to cultivate in his solitude and what he is aiming for in his mission on earth is the challenge of loving the imperfect. Um, and, and, and then in, in almost in a self-reflection with himself says, you know, this, this saint doesn't know yet that God is dead. So that the idea there is, I think, pretty clear that he's saying any notion of an eternal perfection um, is we have to we have to do away with this notion. We have to do away with the notion of an eternal perfection. And that that once we do away with that notion, we will be ready to confront the challenge of time which is a theme that comes up throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and the challenge of imperfection, the fact that all humans are flawed um, and that it can be extremely trying, extremely difficult to love through that crack, to love through that um, failure, to love through those mistakes. But um, this already points us towards the meaning of the overman and, and also the, the function of God as a perfect image, which Nietzsche sort of has a, a, an intuition or a sensitivity that uh, it prevents us from becoming the overman, basically. So that leads us directly into the notion of the overman. And, and, and right away, we see Nietzsche as a philosopher who is directly or indirectly confronting the challenge of a evolutionary or a Dar Darwinian point of view. That is the, the idea of human beings as coming from the animal world. And, and, and in his reference, uh, to the overman, he 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 immediately brings up this idea that you know what is what is what is an ape to a man, and he says a laughing stock and, and and an embarrassment. He says a painful embarrassment. Um, and and indeed, you can say that the the religious sensibilities of the pre-Darwinian pre-evolutionary world were of a um, and even and and the main rejection of Darwinism is this on the basis of this foundation of a, a shame that we come from animals. This you know almost like a hor horrific uh, sensation that 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 we're in any way connected to the animals. Um, but Nietzsche uses that as a gateway to um, introduce the idea that in the same way that that we relate to the apes, 
Um, the overman will relate to us in that same way. The overman will relate to us um, as a, a painful embarrassment, uh, as a laughingstock. Um, so he immediately wants to provoke us uh, in, specifically to get a type of self-reflexive distance from our identification with humans as the pinnacle of evolution and a disidentification with humans as somehow superior um, uh, to, 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 to um, maybe say the superior uh, form of evolutionary processes um, that, 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 we are merely a transition point. We are merely a, 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 a as, as we'll see in the next major concept, we are merely a bridge to something beyond ourselves. And, and that we should think about the human as this constantly going beyond ourselves, this constantly um, overcoming or superseding of ourselves. Um, and uh, he specifically says that, they, that, that, therefore, the pathway to the overman, the pathway to our contribution to the future, which is governed by this idea of the overman, is um, to not listen to those humans who uh, try to console us with, quote unquote, extraterrestrial hopes. And of course, he's talking about you know, the ideas of an afterlife, the ideas of an other world, the ideas of a heaven, the ideas of, of a supernatural being. He says, these ideas are coming from people who are contemptuous of the state of their body, who are contemptuous about the state of their being, and are at the same time too scared and too um, unwise or unknowing to, to realize that they are part of something that they must transcend themselves, that, that, that they must go, must, must go beyond themselves. And, and th this really sets up the entire ethical tone of the book as a whole. This sets up the entire ethical tone. This is, this is trying to introduce us to a different way of thinking about how we think about values, how we think about ethics, how we think about creativity, how we think about humanity. Um, and, and of course, he is directing this message to a type of, you know, Christian slash quasi emerging secular world um, and, and trying and seeking to um, articulate a whole different vision of how we should be thinking about humanity in this in this situation. And I think uh, in, in the 21st century, many of these ideas are still, I mean, the, 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 these ideas are, are, are hyper relevant. These ideas are hyper relevant. Uh, this is what his project, what he's aiming to do. Um, I still think uh, it is, again, just as relevant now as it, as it was um, when he first published this book or when this book was first published, rather. <clears throat> so the next important concept is the idea of mankind as an abyss. Um, and this is where he goes into the idea that we should not think about humans as a, let's say, a permanent identity in a relationship to a supernatural being, but a type of bridge or you could say a process. Um, and that process is linked between the animal and the overman. And so hum what, what human is, is a, is a passageway between these two worlds, the world of the organic animal and the world of the overman, whatever that is. Um, and in many ways, the book is an attempt to start to intimate the existential qualities of the overman. Um, but he's, uh, of course, not fully definitive about what what the Overman is. But but the the whole journey of the book is 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 pushing in that direction, and he already pushes in that direction with this idea of mankind as an abyss. So, what does he mean by this idea of mankind as an abyss on on the deepest level? Well, he's kind of replacing the idea of God with the idea of the abyss. That instead of living in relationship to a transcendent other power, perfect power that we should rather see ourselves as, as a bridge with nothing underneath it. In other words, it, it's kind of like we're, we're, we're all tightrope walkers, that we're, we're on a bridge, and, and, and if we fall off the bridge, well, we, we fall into nothingness. And, and, and I guess this is why you could see Nietzsche as in some way opening up the ideas of a type of radical nihilism and, and, and that this terrifies many people. Um, but for, for, for Nietzsche, he says... You know, the challenge of loving, which I think is central to his whole work, um, the challenge of loving the imperfect 
is only possible if we see man as a bridge and a process with nothing underneath it or nothing above it or nothing else to it. That we are a crossing over, that we are going beyond ourselves and that, that, that you have to cultivate a, a, a full heart or a full soul um, as he has done in his solitude. Um, in order to forget the head or forget the self. And, and, and this is, uh, again, one of the major themes throughout this book, which is a, a, a relationship between the head and the heart, where he gives far more primacy to the heart over the head. Um, uh, that there's, this, I, there's, this, there's this meta theme that the head doesn't understand the heart and that the heart works in mysterious ways and that the pathway to the overman is through the heart and not the head. So it, it, it certainly goes beyond a type of, um, let's say, disembodied rationality. He tries to go beyond, uh, uh, and, and, and the key thing is that not only does he try to go beyond a disembodied rationality, but that that is mirrored in the style of his performance. That is mirrored in the style of his speech and the, the way he's communicating. Um, so he, he doesn't just understand this intellectually. He has understood this emotionally. He has spent 10 years uh, meditating on this, um, really being with this abyss, understanding the consequences of it, um, and is now trying to share that with us as a, as a, as a, as a human family, let's say. Um, and then connects it to what he sees as the alternative risk as we enter this, let's say, post-religious age, this age in which God is dead which is the idea of the last man. And, and, and he says the last man specifically is a man who no longer has contempt for himself, that he no longer wants to go beyond himself. In other words, the idea of man as not having contempt for himself is a man who sees himself as okay the way he is now. He's identified with himself strictly. Um, he's no longer trying to uh, critique himself to go beyond himself. And, and, and then he says, um, falls into very superficial values, uh, lives a life of pleasure, lives a life of comfort, lives a life of longevity for longevity's sake, uh, cheap happiness and quick reconciliation, um, <clears throat> and, and, and become satisfied with unconscious socialization. And I, and I think that this idea of the last man um, and the way he describes the last man is is again extremely relevant and prophetic even for the type of human being that has emerged in let's say late late capitalism i'm, I'm always skeptical of saying things like late capitalism but say the neoliberal capitalist era where it does seem like many people's value systems are organized around pleasure organized around comfort organized around longevity for its own sake so for example you know the idea of living till 80 or living till 90 or living till 100, but not really living in the sense of having a extremely intense and passionate quality of life. Um, and, and also in a philosophical context that <clears throat> here Nietzsche is certainly foreshadowing um, Many of the important principles that will, will come up in the development of psychoanalysis, specifically thinking here of the idea of the beyond of the pleasure principle, well, Nietzsche's saying here is that, that basically the overman is a cultivation of the beyond of the pleasure principle. That the overman is not someone who is getting um, over-identified or over-situated uh, within a, a realm of comfort and and cheap happiness and you know like netflix netflix and chill eating junk food playing video games all of these types of things again <clears throat> it's interesting also that he emphasizes quick reconciliation that the the last man does not like to engage in conflict which we'll see is a major theme for the overman um, and unconscious socializing. So like basically not trying to put in the work with our social relationships to, let's say, make the more difficult aspects of our social relationships conscious to really see what we can learn from digging around in the, the nooks and cracks of our social life. And consequently, 
He says the overman has no real love, uh, has no real creativity, has no real longing, uh, and, and, and cannot give birth to a, a dancing star. I think this is where we have the famous line about one cannot give birth to a dancing star unless one is dancing with the chaos inside of one's heart. And uh, the last man is is the opposite of a dancing star. <clears throat> he is the opposite of a, the opposite of a, a being that's willing to confront the more chaotic edges of our existence. Uh, and uh, consequently becomes basically dead before you really die, I think is, is the main message here. Uh, and the value that Nietzsche holds for the overman is this, is, is what is great in man is again, this, that we are a bridge. You get this idea that we are again, like a tightrope walker walking over an abyss. And indeed that is an example he gives in the, in the preface, which stands out in a profound way that the overman is, uh, or that the human who is oriented towards the overman rather is a being that is risking one's life uh, in competition, not looking for a quick reconciliation or comfort or security. The overman is someone who is going out on the edge. The overman is someone who is 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 is, is risking life and limb in, in many situations. Uh, and specifically talks about the idea of man as uh, making his vocation out of danger. Um, and that there's nothing contemptible about that. On the on the contrary, what is contemptible is is sort of not willing to really work for something that you really believe in and and that where you're really risking something. Um, so basically, you you see right off the bat um, the two orientations where Nietzsche's um, pointing at negating something, which is sort of the comfortable, secure life where we can become isolated in, in simple pleasures and happiness and the, the extreme life of, of pushing our limits, of challenging our identity, of uh, going outside of our comfort zone. These are all things that Nietzsche is saying is uh, the path to the overman. And that, that um, as a consequence of living in that way, um, we have a new way of seeing. Um, that the overman is taught through cultivating a different sensitivity. So it's not really something that you can learn through a lecture like this necessarily, although this might help to clarify certain concepts and maybe get a, a bright idea or to make certain connections inside your own head, which maybe you had been wondering about or, or pondering about. But, but ultimately, the only way to teach the overman for Nietzsche is to cultivate a different sensitivity inside oneself. So um, it could be related to embodied practice. It could be related to um, trying something completely new. It could be related to um, valuing a drive and a creative um, endeavor, which um, takes you to a new world. Um, the, 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 the main idea here, at least that strikes to me, is that you are constantly shaking up your sensitivity and you're constantly refreshing and renewing the way you see the world and the way you see others and, and, and the way you see yourself. And he says that common man, um, their sensitivity um, is, will perceive the overman as, uh, of course, an alien being, a different type of being. They won't really understand the overman. Um, that the overman sensitivity is further away. Um, so, so I just want to emphasize here that, 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 when we're talking about the difference between the human and the overman at the ground of this being, we're talking about two very different types of sensitivities first and foremost, um, which I don't think is emphasized quite as much as it should be when we discuss the idea of the overman. Um, okay. Now he emphasizes um, that while 
a great deal of the path of, of becoming the overman involves solitude. And again, that will be a theme that emerges throughout the book. Um, he quickly realizes that he cannot proselytize or he cannot, um, let's say, teach the overman in a, in a, in a way that, that, that a man with, um, let's say, numbed senses will be able to really see him. And, and actually, in fact, the man or woman of numbed senses will probably perceive him as crazy or a fool. Um, and, and so he concludes that, that on this pathway to the overman, the herd or the crowd or the social group must be angry with me. But at the same time, it would be nice if on this pathway uh, we could strive together. That is to strive with others who are also striving for the overman. So not a relationship between, say, a teacher and a student so much as um, a, uh, let's say, diverse individuals who are all trying to point beyond themselves, I think is what he's trying to go towards here. Um, that instead of being in a group or a herd or, 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 or like a, a coalesced, identified, reified boundary of people, uh, like he's not trying to recreate a new Christianity or something like that, um, but rather individuals who are all striving for the overman. And you could see why ideas of uh, individuation come out of this um, philosophy. Um, ideas of the importance of individual difference come, come out of this philosophy. Um, uh, and that the point of these companions who are all striving for the overman is to create new values and to simultaneously, uh, he says, to break the old values, um, to challenge the old structures of valuation of, of what humans in the past thought of, uh, thought of as a meaningful life or what humans in the past thought of as good and evil. Um, and to, to, he says, write new values and, and make new tables um, upon which we organize our, our, our understanding of um, the meaning of life on earth. Um, and towards that, I, get, I guess you could say these three concepts, the camel, the lion, and the child are... Um, organized under a, a subheading called the metamorphoses of the spirit, where you could in some sense say that these three identities um, are markers or, 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 or key transformation points on the path from um, a human being to the overman. Um, and it might not be intuitively obvious right off the bat what the connection is between these three concepts of a camel, a lion, and a child, but um, there is a sort of deep wisdom in these concepts and also a foreshadowing of Nietzsche's style of using um, metaphors from, from life. Uh, you, he, Nietzsche's philosophy is very much alive. It's, it, it is organic. Uh, he uses many metaphors from, from the behavior of life around him. Um, and he presents himself as someone who has gone into the nooks and crannies of life and, and has really, you know, not, not someone who's studied biology in a, in a university, but someone who has really gone and smelled and sensed and tasted and touched and, 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 and been on the inside of the motivations of organisms and, and the way beings are. But already this philosophical system reflects this style and temperament. So um, the idea of the camel is basically the first step beyond the last man, which again, he says is something that is barricaded in with pleasure and comfort and security. Well, the camel, he says, is uh, the spirit which renounces pleasure um, and demands to carry the heaviest weight. Um, so you can think about here, uh, you know, the, the building up spirit by carrying something heavy. Uh, carrying something heavy for heaviness's sake, because you don't want to just do the easy thing. You want to do the hard thing. You want to you want to test your spirit, and so that's the camel. The lion is the next transformation of spirit or metamorphoses of spirit, which is the spirit which hunts freedom, um, and the spirit that wants to master desire or truth. 
And here, what's important for Nietzsche is that desire and truth are closely linked. Um, and that will become more and more salient as, as, we, develop, as, we, as we work through the book. Um, but this idea of the second stage is freedom is, is, is what's distinct from the lion to the camel is that you no longer just want to carry something heavy for something heavy's sake. You want to actually, you, you've built up your spirit a bit now and, and you want to go on a hunt for what freedom is. What does it mean to be free? Um, it's almost like you've built up a lot of routines and a lot of schedule and a lot of, um, you know, you, you've trained yourself, you've disciplined yourself. And now you want to explore a new, a new space of, of freedom. And you also want to figure out what the truth of your desire is. You want to figure out, well, what do I really want? And, and why do I want that? And, 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 and you want to understand your body. You want to understand the way you are mentally putting your body in motion and how you're organizing your, your bodily energy. And then finally, the child, which is the, the final metamorphosis of spirit in this, this will again be a theme throughout the rest of the book, that the, the idea of the child, um, of returning to a state of innocence, of returning to a state of forgetfulness, of, of, of returning to a sort of clean and empty subject, that is, as it were, seeing the world for the first time um, it is what he sees as what's necessary for the overman to create new values um, and to 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 live, to really be alive. Uh, you almost get this idea that what hum what most human adults struggle with is this dulled sensitivity, and that they can't see the world with fresh eyes, and they almost remember too much and it's almost like they're carrying too much so i think nietzsche would put most a lot of adult humans in the category of of the camel um that they spend their entire life carrying a heavy load um but they never really search for freedom and they never really search for the truth of their desire and so they miss the gateway through which you can um see the world anew uh, they miss the gateway through which you can be reborn, as it were, uh, uh, um, and, and, and reach a type of, I, th I think, might be fair to say, a type of primordial affirmation. But it's interesting to put into context that this primordial affirmation is coming through a series of negations and negations of those negations. And, and, and then you do get to, uh, in Nietzsche's philosophy, a type of primordial affirmation. Um, he has some notions on wise men, which are quite contradictory and paradoxical. Now, the, 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 the example in the book of the why of when he's talking about wise men is it's actually an, an, an you get the feeling like it's a type of, um, Eastern wise man. Here's a picture of Jesus, but you know, he, he's just giving a speech to a, to a, to a, a group of people. And he's talking about, um, how it's extremely important to sleep well and that people who don't sleep well um, are people who are not really alive. Um, and, and, and although Nietzsche or Zarathustra, I should say, um, sees a lot of value in this wise lesson, he, he sort of s uses the example to scoff at the idea of wise men, uh, that is, people who are just proselytizing the same message over and over and over again. Um, and that the, the whole point of wise men is to talk to people who aren't sleeping well, um, which is, again, a, an interesting way to think about the idea of Nietzsche as a type of precursor to psychoanalysis, since what is psychoanalysis, if not the reverse of the wise man, where you are speaking your dreams to someone who's mostly silent, as opposed to a wise man telling you, um, how to sleep well. So there's this inversion between the wise man as traditionally conceived and um, let's say the, 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 the sensibility of the overman. Um, and specifically here, Nietzsche's point, it would be almost the opposite, that, that, that it is important to sleep well, but what's more important is to be really dreaming while you're alive and to really be transforming yourself while you're alive. That's really the the point of the overman and that I suppose he sees wise men as a type of block or, or, or gap to, to people really owning their own dreams and to really, you know, transforming themselves. 
Um, now connected to that is this idea of the hinterworldly. The idea of the hinterworldly is basically the idea of people who would prefer to live with a delusion of an other world, uh, a delusion of an eternal uh, perfect world, um, as opposed to really being alive in this world. Um, and he, he claims that the, the source for the hinterworldly is a, an unconscious despising of the body and the earth. Uh, he's saying that, that most people and people who are, you know, trying to live well in this life for the afterlife are people who actually hate their body and, and hate, hate the earth. And they're bitter and they're resentful. And um, they actually don't want to be alive. Um, and that the opposite of the hinterworldly are people who love this world. So he he opposes hinterworldly to this worldly. And the this worldly people, he claims, um, they see contradiction, self-contradiction as honesty. Um, and they, the this worldly see the, 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 they see this body and the voice of this body as the meaning of the earth and the meaning of life. Um, and that they want the body, that they, they want to explore this life and they want to explore what it means to be alive right now. Um, so this is, again, a, a crucial distinction that, that sits really nicely into Nietzsche's overall philosophy um, and really hammers home some of his, uh, his, I think, in a very simple way, um, what he's trying to negate and also what he's trying to, to point towards. Uh, connected to that is the idea that for Nietzsche, there is no distinction between the soul and the body, that the soul is the body. Um, and that enlightenment is a recognition that the, that the soul is the body, the body is the soul. Um, I think in many ways, this mirrors Hegel's idea of the spirit is a bone. Um, and he says, the secret of the awakened body is that the awakened body constantly wants to create beyond itself. It constantly wants to, but it's not going beyond itself to another world. It's going beyond itself here and now in this world um, and constantly transforming itself here. And that he says, despisers of the body are either unaware that they can create beyond themselves here, or they simply no longer are capable of creating beyond themselves here. And so they try to enforce a dogma that that nobody can create beyond themselves here and that the true creation lies beyond death. Um, but yeah, the ground for Nietzsche, and this becomes obvious, again, it's a very organic philosophy, this idea of the body is fundamental. The idea that it's actually, most people want to escape the body and the truth of the body and the truth of desire. And as a consequence, his in his writing, he's, he really, you get this feeling like he's really crawling inside of you, like that, that he's really explored life and he's really explored his body. And that emanates and that, 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 that just, <clears throat> it oozes from everything he's doing. From that, he says the ground, of course, is the body and, 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 and thus the way in which one cultivates virtue is not just through, you know, having ideas of virtue or having ideas of the good or you know just having this in your head this idea of wanting to be a good person he says <clears throat> basically that virtues grow out of the passions um, and he has this idea and i think that this is connected to his theory of good and evil which is that good and evil are seen as one and the same thing really they're, they're seen as connected they're not seen as two separate things um, and, and again, that, that virtue grows out of the passions or good grows out of evil. And so one really has to understand one's passions or one really has to one on one, one really has to understand one's own capacity for evil before one really can be truly good, uh, and truly virtuous. And he says, as a result of that, that being the way that virtue is cultivated, that once one has cultivated, um, virtue, that that virtue is singularly unique to you because that is something that you have won. Um, you can't, in other words, 
you can't get this in a book. Um, you can't get this from reading a religious text. Um, this is something that you have to go to war with and for. And <clears throat> he has some very interesting lines about virtue being greedy and wanting the entire spirit. So in other words, you have to challenge all the nooks and crannies of your being. Um, virtue wants all of you. Um, and also that virtue is another pathway to the overman because he says, because virtue wants all of you, uh, you have to perish for your virtue. You have to die for your virtue. So <clears throat> in that sense, he's, he's also cultivating an ethic of how to die, uh, how to die well. And, and that foreshadows something that we'll go more in detail about in future slides. Um, but that, you know, it points to the idea that, that, that some of the great figures in human history, this set, some of the great figures in human history who really died for their virtue as they were sort of anchors or orientation points for the overman, uh, for Nietzsche. And as a result of that, that you can't really develop true virtue without understanding two very important concepts in his philosophy, which is madness and shame. He says, the average human is secretly ashamed of their madness. And they have this unconscious suspicion that they're not equal to the action of their madness or they're not, they're not equal to the, they're not equal to what's really going on inside of them, inside their body, inside their desires. Um, and that we all have a desire to kill. We all have a desire and that, that we all try to hurt others um, in, the, in the same way that we are hurt. Um, he calls this madness after the deed, um, which is basically like a type of retroactive failure to accept what we are. Um, and that's where shame comes from. So basically, because we can't really accept what we are, because we can't really confront our desire, we can't really confront, we, we feel too much shame about it. Um, we just have a, a lot of repression, basically. And, and, and again, this is another way in which I think you can see Nietzsche as a foreshadowing of psychoanalysis. <coughs> so... It's, it's very interesting that he says in this, in these sections, that we become sick from our inner images, that we become covered in guilt and shame, um, that we don't like the images in our own reflection. Um, and I think actually this is a lot of, a lot of the reason for the resistance to post-Kantian philosophy is that philosophers beyond Kant they are willing to really confront the truth of the images and the self-reflectivity and, 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 and what's really inside of us and really going to the core of the human being. And as a consequence of, of a lot of other forms of knowledge not following in that pathway, I think they, they become a very monochromatic and they, they do become very disembodied. Um, even if they are espousing concepts of, of disembodied, uh, uh, sorry, even if they are espousing concepts of embodiment, um, it's very obvious that, that they themselves are, are not embodied. Um, I guess I'll, I'll say here, the final idea is that Nietzsche does give a sort of method for becoming closer to your madness and to become less shameful about your being which is basically that one needs to shake one's head that is that one's head is in the way of the truth um, and that you need to shake yourself to the truth and you have to sort of unstiffen yourself and unparalyze yourself and unburden yourself with the heaviness of reason and the heaviness of your head Um, and from that standpoint, I think would be Nietzsche's ethic of writing and reading that 
Um, when one's writing, one should be writing in one's own spirit or what Nietzsche calls one's own blood, that you should be writing in blood. Um, what he means by that is just you're, you're writing from your soul, you're writing from your body, you're writing from what's going on, you're writing from yourself. And that he's actually quite critical of reading culture, what he calls reading culture. <clears throat> and coupled with that, that he claims that um, for those that do write in blood, that they want to be learned by heart. So they want readers who are learning by heart, not just understanding them intellectually. Uh, that, that again, it's, it's almost like this idea that, you know, you want readers who really crawl inside your soul, just like Nietzsche is trying to crawl inside your soul. It's trying to get to like a new depth of communication. Um, and that our writing should address the highest. He says we should not write for the masses or, you know, he doesn't, uh, he wouldn't like media culture or, or mass media that we should try to address the greatest and that we should um, strive to be the greatest in our writing and our reading. Um, uh, another interesting thing that, 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 that is brought up in this section is this idea that the overman laughs at tragedy. Um, and so you get this idea that the, that the person who's writing and reading in blood can sort of transform tragedies into triumphs. Um, and that they, they, from that they become so much higher um, because they, they they can retroactively laugh at the things that hurt them in the past um, and have really overcome them. Uh, and that 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 connects into the idea of the the seeker of knowledge. That that when Nietzsche talks about a seeker of knowledge, he's not talking about someone who's just seeking for again rational disembodied knowledge. He's basically thinking about someone who's seeking for themselves. But he warns us that on this path, that it's very likely even inevitable that we will lose trust in ourselves, and that we will lose trust in others and others will lose trust in us. Um, and that we will find ourselves in constant contradiction. <clears throat> and not only contradiction, but also loneliness. And, and again, that connects us back to the, the beginning of the book, because Nietzsche is saying, look, I, I, or Zarathustra is saying, look, I, I, I've been in isolation. I've been in solitude for 10 years. Um, and if you follow my path, that might happen to you as well. You might have to go into extreme forms of loneliness and, and isolation. Um, and you might have to wrestle with your demons. You might have to wrestle with your, your deep envious nature, your jealous nature. Um, You'll have to wrestle with the mysteries of your desire, what you really want. Uh, it, it's not an easy path. This is not a, it, it's a path that's going to come with a lot of struggle. It's, it's going to come with a lot of inner war and torment. Um, but that, you know, um, ultimately the only other option would be something like being the last man. Uh, which we, we've already covered. Um, and, and really, he, he does say specifically that, that really what's at work here in this seeking for knowledge, again, coupled with this idea of the soul and the body, is this idea that when you're seeking, your instincts are still wicked, but you have, you know, the ideas of great heights in your mind. Um, and, and so, so this, 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 this split between the body and the mind, um, which is again, a very similar way to how Freud articulates the split in the psyche at the beginning of psychoanalysis, <clears throat> the idea of the split between the sex and the ego instincts is really the first distinction in psychoanalysis. And, and a similar idea here is emerging in Nietzsche's work. So certainly pointing towards this idea that what's at stake in a post-religious age is a, a battling with one's own body, a battling with one's own instincts, a battling with one's own nature, and really understanding one's own self in that way. Um, which basically means that we have to become warriors of knowledge. Um, and, and that we have to, you know, when he talks about knowledge, he, he's really talking about confronting the heart, heart's knowledge, 
he's talking about hate and envy. He's saying that you are not ready to be saints yet. You are not ready. You, you, you don't have that nature yet. You have to win that nature. You have to, you have to confront your deepest hate. You have to confront your deepest envy. Um, and you have to discipline yourself for the highest possibilities in yourself and, and wage war for it. And it's not, and again, it's not going to be easy. It's, it's going to be a struggle for knowledge. And uh, just sort of tie in this idea of the seeking, which leads you into contradiction and aloneness and this idea of warrior that you have to battle for self-knowledge. This is, yeah, this is very foreign from, of course, like the, the whole academic structure and the whole the whole ways in which we set up institutions of knowledge and the whole way in which we think about learned men and the, the whole way we think about knowledgeable people. Um, and that, that will become more and more obvious as we go through the book. <clears throat> so this idea of death preachers is the idea, again, I think connected to the hinter worldly. I think Nietzsche would see the hinter worldly as connected to the preachers of death. He says that, the, again, the preachers of death are people that yearn for the eternal life um, and that they believe life is only suffering and that sex is only sin and children are a waste of time and, and, and that, that all we are is terrible lust and self-laceration for our lust. You can see the type of picture he's painting here um, and the way in, in, in which it must be situated in relationship to the Christian world in which he's writing. Um, and it would be interesting to interpret the main passages and his main sentiments here in relationship to the 21st century. <clears throat> but certainly this idea um, that sex is problematic and life is suffering and that we have to just, uh, you know, lacerate ourselves for our lust. Um, Nietzsche is not so much saying the opposite, namely that we should just have sex and life is just great and so forth. But um, again, it's sort of like in condemning the very body and condemning what we are, you never, you, you shut down or you foreclose any possibility that you can discover yourself in this life on this side. And that's why he's, he's, he's linking these ideas to the ideas of preachers of death. So he does go into analyzing some social phenomenon as it relates to the overman in the, in the first part. And, 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 and in the next two sections, we'll be seeing that very clearly in the idea of the state and the marketplace, you know, the modern notions of the state and the market. Um, and, and as it relates to the state, um, he has very complex ideas, but, but ultimately he is against, of course, the state. Um, <clears throat> He sees the state as something which devours people and um, um, and, and is a, as acts like a cold monster and lies and fabricates. Um, and that the state in the modern world has replaced God as the idol. So basically he's saying that modern people worship the state instead of worshiping the possibilities of the overman. You could even say that the people who worship the state are kind of the last men for Nietzsche, like the, the, the people who are using the state to get comfort, the people who are using the state to get security, using the state to, to, to feel good about themselves and, and, and to, 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 you know, to, to have a, a safe life uh, instead of risking life and, and, and becoming great themselves. Um, so you get this idea that the state is kind of a vehicle for the type of, let's say, ideology of the last man. So if you connect the ideas from the last man to the state, I think you get a, a nice little couple uh, in Nietzsche's philosophy. <clears throat> and the marketplace. So he says that you should avoid the great men of the marketplace. Um, that people who are... Um, always making noise, people who are constantly looking and seeking for attention. Um, you might say what we call today like clout chasing. Um, that these people you should stay away from and, and, and alternatively, you should go into your solitude, that you should um, create new values in your solitude. So um, 
you know, with the combination of his criticisms of the state as a type of overly secure, overly comforting structure, to his ideas of the marketplace, where you get this idea of, you know, a lot of noise. Um, the alternative he's sort of pointing towards is this idea that you should cultivate your aloneness, you should go deep inside yourself, and you should struggle for what you truly believe in. You should struggle to create something truly new. And, and that sort of breaks the state market duality in, um, in Nietzsche's philosophy. Chastity is the next one, which is, you know, he, he starts out by saying that, <clears throat> that most men think sensual lust with a woman is the highest possibility of earth. And he challenges this and he says that um, these men do not know the overman. So I, I want to try to connect this idea of chastity and this idea of sublimation of sexual energy <clears throat> with the way Nietzsche is ethically orienting us as it relates to the state and the market. So again, sort of this idea that we should not use the state for comfort and security. We should not listen to all the noise on the market. We should go into ourselves. We should cultivate our aloneness and we should learn about our body. And we should try to understand the joys of the body. And we should try to understand, he says, to train our senses towards the innocence of the body um, so that we can, he says explicitly, we should kill the bitch of sensuality, um, which leers with envy out of what he thinks most men do or most humans do. And ultimately, he points towards the idea that a truly chaste person is not only mild of heart, but asks himself, what is chastity? So in other words, um, this is not a renunciatory, um, you know, again, self-lacerating type of man, but a man who understands his body so well and understands his sexual energy so well that he's kind of, he, he doesn't anymore think that lying with a woman and, and his lust for a woman is the highest point of life. And connected to the idea of living companions, um, Nietzsche points towards friends. Um, and, and he really is a philosopher that believes that friends or living companions that are helping us strive towards becoming better, um, that, are, that are willing to go to war with us and, and wage war with us, like when, when they feel like we're off our, our, our path, when they feel we've gone the wrong way that we should honor both the, the friend and the foe inside of our friend um, and that we should be closest to our friends when we're resisting them. So to, to build them up towards to being better than, than to, to what we know is inside them and what can come out of them. Um, and interesting that he, he, he emphasizes that, that both the slave and the tyrant ideologies inside of our minds are, are things we have to transcend to really be a friend. Um, and that a friend is a longing towards the overman, that the friend is, um, you, again, you get this idea of a loosely connected distributed network of, of individuals who are focused on their own sort of becoming in relationship to their solitude um, and cultivating their inner creativity, um, understanding their body, um, challenging themselves every day to become better than they were the previous day. This is sort of the idea that comes out of a lot of Nietzsche's work. Uh, the idea of good and evil is a major theme in Nietzsche's work, of course, related to valuation and values. Um, he says good and evil are actually the real marketplace of the earth and that um, good and evil are based on our esteeming, which means our respect and our admiration. So we call good, what is good is things we respect and admire. What is evil, things we disrespect, we don't admire. Um, and that people admire and respect differently in different areas, but all of them are basically within this larger marketplace of good and evil. Um, <clears throat> and that for Nietzsche, even all the different cultures of the planet have different systems of good and evil. He says they all point towards one goal, and that one goal is the overman. 
Um, so it, it, it's, I think, kind of this idea that we should take a skeptical distance from and a critical distance from any of the systems of good and evil, what, what we've been told good and evil are. We should investigate what is good and evil inside of ourselves. Um, and we should use that as the energy or the fuel for overcoming ourselves, for transcending ourselves, from becoming the best versions of ourselves um, that we can possibly be. Um, and, and I think this idea of the neighbor here connected to that is, is actually more connected both to the idea of the friend and the idea of the state and the marketplace where we've, we've just been covering which is that Nietzsche has a very negative perception of the neighbor, which is that he thinks most people surround themselves with casual connections, neighbors, because people are unable to really be with themselves and stand on their own. So there is this meta ethic in Nietzsche of this, of standing on your own, of, of really being confronting your own, your own, again, solitude and loneliness and, and, and really becoming best friends with yourself instead of surrounding yourself with, with neighbors who are, are taking you away from your aloneness, but they're really only a, uh, again, a stopgap for the void. They're a stopgap for the inner abyss inside yourself. And um, as, and again, he, 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 against the, against the neighbor, he, he, he privileges the friend. And he likens, <clears throat> kind of get this idea that the neighbor only reveals a, a part of himself to you, um, but that the friend reveals a, a complete world. That the friend is a is a reveals the total the totality of of his or her being, and that 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 is a valuable, and that 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 is again pointing us towards the overman. Um, the idea of creativity is front and center in Nietzsche's work. It's the idea that if you again connected to many of the themes we've been discussing up to this point. It's the idea that the group or the crowd, whether it's the state or whether it's the market, that they don't really encourage the isolation and the, the, the self-sufficiency required for true creativity. And that the way to true creativity has to go through your own misery, has to go through your own dark night of the soul, let's say. And you need the strength for that to, in order to shine. Um. He has some remarkable passages about burning yourself in your own flame um, instead of almost like parasitizing yourself on the flames of other people. You know, he says that is the path of the lonely one um, and that you should go with your isolation um, and, and that create true creativity and true justice will. It's an interesting line. He says, will limp after you. Um, but the, but that that's that's sort of the you you sort of get uh, an overall vision here of 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 what Nietzsche is again pointing towards with basically the social commentaries as they relate always to the Overman. Um, now we might get into some controversial territory here um, because towards the end of part one, Nietzsche not only brings up his ideas of women. Um, but he also will be talking about his ideas of children and marriage. And <clears throat> he is clear to emphasize in this section on women that this whole book is directed at humans in general. So it's not just directed at men. He's, I do get the feeling like he believes everyone can, quote unquote, become the overman, men and women, and should aim towards the overman. But there is also sexual difference at work in Nietzsche's in Nietzsche's philosophy, and specifically that 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 sexual difference seems to, at least in this passage, essentialize the riddle of the woman as being related to pregnancy and being related to the child. So, in the same way that the overman is someone whose spirit is metamorphosizing into the child through the lion, uh, through the camel and the lion, he does sort of present this idea that it would be more difficult for a woman to do that simply because they are so perhaps bio neurologically wired towards the child, like the actual child. 
Um, and he does say like that um, the overman for a woman should be to bear the overman, to 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 have the overman as her child, and to to raise the overman. Um, at least this is how he situates the overman into a world of sexual difference. Um, and he says, you know, almost like as a warning to men, um, as he's already warned men as it relates to their own sexual lust and putting sort of women on a pedestal, let's say, as the pinnacle of um, desire and as the pinnacle of the highest sensual pleasure. Um, <clears throat> he does sort of warn men about um, sort of woman seeing man as a means to an end that being the means to the end being a child. Um, and so he says that the riddle of every woman has a, one solution and that's pregnancy. Now, the degree to which this philosophy has a sort of deep relevance and um, sort of speaks to the 21st century, I think is a really interesting discussion. Um, I would actually be really interested in whether it be feminist or whether it be modern social theories uh, or, or just talking to men and women about, about, about the way Nietzsche approaches sexual difference in the overman. I think that would be a really interesting conversation as well as psychoanalysis. That would be a very interesting conversation. But this is sort of how he's setting up the relationship between men and women uh, in the first part of the book. Um, now, related to that is this idea of the, the, the nature of the enemy, um, where we could see the sexual other as an enemy, we could see a friend as an enemy, we could see a neighbor as an enemy. Um, ultimately, um, what Nietzsche is saying here is that we should see enemies as a wake-up call. Um, that enemies should wake us up, and we should thank them for it. Um, that they should be kind of like... Um, <clears throat> we should see the overman as something that is, you know, he gives the example of a snake biting him while he's sleeping, um, which I think really conveys again, like sort of the, 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 the way Nietzsche is trying to articulate his philosophy. And when, he, when the snake wakes him up after biting him, he says, thank you for giving me this poison. Um, but, but take it back because you're not rich enough to attack me. So you really get this idea that we should thank our enemies for waking us up. And you also get this idea that, you know, anyone who's attacking you is kind of lower than you. Um, and, and, and that, you know, you should see them as almost draining their own energy and attacking you, um, which is an interesting way of, of framing it. And, and, and actually quite challenging when you apply that principle to, you know, things that really go wrong in your own life because of someone becoming your enemy. Okay, so we have two more two more slides here. The first is on children and marriage. Um, now Nietzsche has very interesting ideas about this, in my opinion, which is he says first and foremost, you should have won the right to get married and have children in yourself before you actually do it. And by winning the right to have mar to get married and have children, he means to conquer, uh, to be the victor of your senses and your virtue. That's connected to many of the things we've talked about throughout this, this presentation. Um, he says, once you are the victor and the self-conqueror of your senses and your virtue, and the desire for marriage and children speaks from that space, as opposed to speaking from the place of neediness or loneliness or discord within yourself, um, that go for it, that marriage is a fantastic structure to raise, raise many children, to reproduce many children, um, and that you should see this as a vehicle for the overman, that you should you raising, raising the next generation that could become the overman and women. So certainly here, there's no conflict or contradiction in Nietzsche's philosophy with family building and and reproduction. It's more, he's more questioning the motivation systems that go into having children and raising a family. Um, and really sort of hoping that 
the people who have children are people who have self-knowledge as opposed to people unconsciously reproducing, which is by far the, the, the been the norm throughout human history, perhaps out of necessity. Um, and I want to say the final idea here as it relates to this is that he says a precondition to really loving is that you have drunk the own, your own, the bitterness of your own cup of love. In other words, you have to realize how deep, how hard it is to love. Again, connected to the beginning of the, the book, that it's very hard to love the imperfectness of another human. And I think that we're challenged the most in romantic relationships with the imperfection of the other. Um, and that you have to drink the bitterness of your own love before you can really love another person. Um, but that by doing that, by drinking the bitterness of your own love, um, that this itself causes a, a longing for the overman, uh, Nietzsche suggests. And then finally, the concept of free death, that, that Nietzsche ends the first part by reflecting on the idea that you should die at the right time, that you shouldn't um, hope for eternal life uh, or something like that, or you shouldn't hope for longevity for longevity's sake, which is, again, the last man. But they should die at the right time and that death should be a festival, that we should learn to celebrate death um, as a victory of a great life. Um, and that he says that the way you'll know when to die at the right time is by having a true goal and, uh, and, a, and a righteous heir um, uh, who, can, who can pass on uh, who you can pass the game on to, um, that you can pass the ball on to, so to speak. And I think that that's a great death. Um, to, that, that's when he says you'll know when, you know, you're in that state of, 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 of dying at the right time. So that's the book. Now, now that's the, the, the first act of the book. Now, what I've done here is I've basically organized some of the main themes of what I've just gone over. Um, so, uh, for those of you who are, you know, going to use this video as study material for, for those of you who are going to use this, uh, this, this video as, as a sort of a window into more deeply understanding thus spoke Zarathustra, this screen will like give you a, a good overview of, of all the content we just covered. So I'll just, I'll move here in, in clockwise, uh, formation from the top left-hand corner. Um, to the top right-hand corner down and, 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 and back. Uh, just to sort of re-emphasize some of the core points I think you should reflect on in, 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 in approaching this book. So he says, um, our hearts basically become, the se become center stage after the death of God and that you know, what's really at, at stake for the heart's knowledge is to love the imperfect and that that's the real challenge and that's the real self-overcoming and that we can only really overcome ourselves in loving what's imperfect about others and, and, and really being in the human world, but also pointing beyond the human world. And that's also where all meaning comes from. Um, and and that, that, that the, 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 the last man can't really do this, that the last man can't really confront the temporal process and he blocks life with comfort and pleasure. Um, and so you get to get those two fundamental orientation points for Nietzsche that he's pointing away from negating and pointing towards or, you know, affirming. Um, in the top right hand corner there, um, you get this idea that the overman enjoys struggle and is constantly renewing his senses and, and finding the others who are engaged in a similar striving. So again, this emphasis on friendship. And his emphasis on friendship as a, as a struggle and as a, you know, a, a, that tries to cultivate spaces of conflict where you can help each other go beyond yourselves. Um, there's this idea of the metamorphoses of the spirit as uh, carrying the heaviest load and then mastering your desire for truth uh, and your desire as truth. And then finally returning to a type of childhood sensitivity to the innocence and the forgetting of a, of a childhood mind and to be able to see the world with fresh eyes and, and, and with new eyes. Uh, and finally, to get rid of all the delusions of another world and to really love the body and the earth and the voice of the body as the soul, 
uh, all of this is 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 central to the path of the overman. Um, but in order to do that, now moving to the um, bottom left-hand corner, um, that one has to cultivate one's virtue from one's own passions, or one has to cultivate one's own good from from evil. And so this is not from a book. This is from your own life and your own body and your own self. And that virtue wants all of you and that 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 all the crooks and cracks and all the creaks of your body and all everything about you has to be processed through the sieve of of your of your of your virtue and that that will require not just reason but reason in madness that you have to seek your own self-knowledge as a type of war um and that that people in the state and people in the market life they they won't understand this they won't understand the value of this um but you have to transform you know, your highest sensual lust basically for the woman into the overman. So all of that energy, all of that passion, all of that desire that goes into the sexual other in the most general sense um, has to be put into yourself and cultivated inside yourself for, for overcoming your own, your own envy and your own lust and your own jealousy. Um, <clears throat> and then on to the, the bottom right-hand corner. Um, that this means that there will be a lot of aloneness on this path, that you have to wrestle with your own frame, flame or you have to burn up your own flame um, and that, that creation and justice will follow, follow in your isolation. Um, and, and that on this path of, of isolation that you have to drink from your own bitter cup of love, you have to realize how hard it would be to love you, uh, that, that, that you are not as lovable as you might think you are. Um, that you are not as great of a person as you might uh, as you might think you are. That there, there's many many things that are imperfect about you, um, and, and, and then when you really understand how imperfect you are, that is the precondition for really being able to love in perfect imperfection. Um, it is a precondition for being able to get married and have children, um, and to understand that the riddle of the woman is the child, um, and so so you get this idea that the man should. Uh, almost become like a child uh, in terms of innocence of his senses and innocence in his desire, um, not putting a woman as the pedestal as the ultimate object, but um, treating a woman as a, a precious other who is ultimately going to bear the future, that is the future child. Um, and that in all of this, the overman aims for death at the right time, not just longevity for longevity's sake, and that that death should be celebrated, that death is a positive feature of life. It's a way we pass the torch on, so to speak. Um, and the passing the ball on requires also cultivating an heir that we can pass the game on, that we have someone to, to care. That might be a child, but that also might be a friend, or that might also be someone that you've you've mentored or, or you'd be a teacher to. Uh, here, a teacher in the sense of an overman. Um, so these are the main themes of Act One, and that this gives you an, an, an overall picture of of what we've just talked about, hopefully. Um, and again, these are the main concepts. Um, we've gone from empty to full heart, where Nietzsche starts the the, the Act One, and and all the way to free death, uh, where he ends Act One, and all of the themes in between. So. This is Act One. This is going to be part of a four-part series, which will be being released. Look out for it in the next two months. I'll, I'll be releasing the, the other three parts of this. Um, and it will really give you a sense of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. It will really give you, a hopefully, a full picture of Nietzsche's overall philosophy and metaphysics. It is a tremendously influential work. It, it influenced many philosophers in the 20th century, including figures like Gilles Deleuze and Martin Heidegger and, um, and, and, and Sigmund Freud and, and much of psychoanalysis and, uh, and, and uh, as well as, as, as many social and political movements, um, not all, not all positive, but, but, but tremendously influential work. Um, and, and again, perhaps one of his, if not his most, uh, important book. Uh, and just finally, just a reminder that that this is all a lead up to a live course on Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, which will be starting July 14th, 2022. There's a link in the description for more information. We're going to be exploring this book as a creative community. 
there will be a project that we'll be aiming towards as a collective. You can see about it as you can see it as like a, 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 a collection of friends who are striving for making themselves better and, and striving for more and, and striving to push themselves in, in, in their creative capacities. Um, and there's also options to have a more one-on-one -on -one time with me to discuss sort of how this book relates to personal life, how this book relates to things you may be going through on a, on a deeply personal level. Um, and, and one of my aims in, in Philosophy Portal and one of my aims with the, the courses I give through Philosophy Portal is really to reveal more of myself in terms of why do I pick the, the philosophies I do and the books I do uh, is, is, is oftentimes, uh, if not as a rule, uh, related to things I'm going through in my personal life. And, and so I, to, to become more open and transparent with that, I think it will enrich and enliven the book. It will, it will make it come to life in, in a new way. Um, so, so check that out if you're interested and, uh, keep an eye out on this channel for more content related to Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Um, thanks so much for watching. If you followed me all this way, uh, thank you so much. And, uh, I will see you when I see you.